We're looking at a painting by Salvador Dali in the Tate Modern. It's The Metamorphosis of Narcissus, and it dates to 1937. It's a pretty wild painting. So what I see that relates to that is this hand that seems to be emerging from the earth that holds an egg from which seems to be hatching uh, Narcissus. Except that so many of Dali's paintings and rendering in Dali's paintings, which are painted in a kind of classical manner in terms of its sort of... It's very realistic. It's precision, it's careful yeah. rendering of space, even if that space is distorted, of shadow, of line. If you look at the egg from which the flower is emerging, it seems to be emerging from a crack that is also the shadow of the flower at the same moment. Mm. And so it's both those things sort of simultaneously. And in fact, the whole painting seems to be about forms being one thing and at the same moment another. Because there is behind that hand another hand that seems to be emerging from a pool of water. This time not rock, but something because it's brown, something that seems more earth-like and holding also an egg-like shape, but actually it looks a little bit more like a walnut. But it also has a crack, and from that seems to emerge hair that looks like a flame. Because the hand is, in that second iteration, not so much a hand as actually a crouching body, the body of Narcissus. You can see knees and arms. But what's wonderful is that whereas the figure that's yellow on the left, slightly further back, is a body where the head is a walnut, on the right, it's more clearly a close-up of a hand holding an egg, and yet they're precisely the same forms. It's that doubling, it's that mirror that's so incredibly disconcerting. All of this needs to be contextualized. What in the world is Dali doing? Well, what he said he was doing and what André Breton lauded him for, he was a writer and often seen as one of the leaders of the Surrealist movement. And he wrote the Surrealist Manifesto. Right, all of the Surrealist Manifestos, or at least a number of them, yes. They called the ability of Dali to do this, to see things simultaneously as more than one thing as a result of a psychological state which they called paranoic critical activity. Par Sounds scary <laughs> and dangerous. <laughs> well, I think they loved the fact that it was scary and dangerous. And it was based on a kind of willful misreading of Freud. You know, Freud talked about the filters that kept the unconscious and the conscious mind apart. But Dali claimed that in this state of paranoid critical activity, ah. he could actually embrace both the conscious and the unconscious simultaneously so that his conscious mind could actually do the painting. The brilliance of understanding that form as both a hand and a body, as flesh and stone simultaneously, that Dali would have claimed was absolutely the result, not of the rational mind, impossible in the rational, but it was the result of the irrational, of a conversation between those two states in this state of paranoid critical activity. Okay. <laughs> it was incredibly important to the surrealist to access that unconscious to access something that was more authentic, that lacked the control of the conscious mind. For them, that was the engine of creativity, absolutely. It was this mother load of the creative. I mean, when we think back to the 19th century and we think back to artists like Gauguin wanting to get back to nature, of Courbet wanting to get back to nature, the unconscious for the surrealists, that was the great goal, you know, right. that was it. So it's so interesting is the surrealists go at this from a number of different points of view, People right. like Miro will try to, in a sense, allow for the unconscious to emerge and to paint using an automatic method, that is, not allowing the conscious mind to interpret. Whereas Dali is sort of wanting both. He wants the perfection of the academic style to render the inspiration of the unconscious. Mm -hmm.